This is True Crime Out Loud. I'm your host, B. And I'm your host, Jen. And this week's case is a listener recommendation. This week's case takes us to Paris, California. Paris is located in Riverside County and has a population of about 79,000. It is located 70 miles from Los Angeles and about 80 miles from San Diego. It begins on Sunday, January 14th of 2018. A 911 call came in at 5.30 a.m. to the California Highway Patrol. And three minutes later, this call was transferred to Riverside County Sheriff's Office. The call was from Jordan Turpin, and she sounded like a young child. When asked for the address, she gave her zip code. She said she didn't know where she was because she didn't go out much and didn't know the streets. But I think it'll do better if you hear it from Jordan herself. I was able to find only a partial of the 911 call, which lasted 20 minutes, but we're going to play you about a minute and a half of it. 911, state your emergency. No, oh, yes, I'm still here. What's your name? Jordan Turpin. I've never been out. I don't go out much, so I don't know anything about the streets or anything. I live in a family of 15 people, and my parents are abusing. They abuse us. And my two little sisters right now are chained up. There's... 13 kids, and then a mother and father. And how many of your siblings are tied up? Two of my sisters, one of my brothers. How are they tied up, with rope or with what? With chains. They're chained up to their bed. Do you think anybody in the house will need to go to the hospital? I'm not sure. Sometimes we live in filth, and sometimes I wake up and I can't breathe because how dirty the house is. When was the last time you had a bath? I don't know, almost a year ago. But sometimes I feel so dirty. I wash my face and I wash my hair. Does anybody at the house take any kind of medication? Oh, I don't know what medication is. Are you homeschooled? No, we don't do school. Our mother tells people we're homeschooled. Our mother tells people we're private school. And she has a fake private school set up. But... We don't really do school. I haven't finished first grade, and I'm 17. I don't know much about my mother. She doesn't like us. She doesn't spend time with us ever. Hi. Is that the deputy? Um, yes. Go talk to him, okay? So the Riverside County Sheriff's Office finds Jordan, and they meet with her. And she showed them a picture she had snuck on the cell phone that she had of her two sisters that were chained up. Well, when they say Jordan, they thought that she was about 10 years old, but like she said, she was actually 17. She told them that her sister Jolinda had actually escaped with her, but Jolinda got scared and immediately went back into the home. So, of course, the police are going to respond to the home. Well, when they went in, they see the other 12 children, and they're all thin, and they all look to be under 18. But their actual ages were 2 to 29. There were only six of them that were under 18, and the other seven of them were adults. They said the smell was an indescribable stench. Only the two-year-old seemed to not be extremely thin like the others, but they were all filthy, and some of them didn't even know what a police officer was. And this naturally leads us to wonder about the adults that are in charge of these people. And first, we're going to talk about David Allen Turpin. He was born in October of 1961. He's the youngest of two boys of Jim and Betty Turpin. He grew up in a religious home in the Princeton Church of God, located in Princeton, West Virginia. Now, Princeton, West Virginia is a small community with 6,400 residents. All the information we found indicated that he had a fairly normal childhood. He seemed to be very intelligent, although slightly awkward. Schoolmates described him as smart, but kind of kept to himself. He dressed conservatively. He was nerdy, is the way they described him. He was a fan of Star Trek and loved cars. 
people stated that he never really had a girlfriend and didn't participate in normal school or social activities. He graduated high school in 1979 and got a scholarship to Virginia Tech in Blacksburg, Virginia for electrical engineering. And the mother in the home was Louise Anna Robinette Turpin, and she was about 50 years old. She was also raised in the Princeton Church of God in Princeton, West Virginia, and she was the oldest child of Alan Wayne Robinette and Phyllis Robinette. So as a child, Louise was described as quiet, and she kind of kept to herself. She didn't have many friends, and she was picked on a little bit at school. The Robinettes had three daughters, Louise, Elizabeth, and Teresa. Louise's childhood was not as normal, I guess you could say, as David's was, because the parents always had these loud arguments. And Phyllis, her mother, really didn't have a big interest in being a mother. When Louise was 10 years old, she was practically taking care of her 18-month-old sister, Elizabeth. I'm going to get into the background of her family a little bit more than we did David. Her mother, Phyllis, had been sexually abused by her own father, and his name was John Taylor. Just a little bit of information about John Taylor. He was a decorated World War II vet. He was very active in politics. He built houses and car lots, and he opened the first Shell gas station in the county, and he was very wealthy. So to those from outside the family, he looked like this church-going pillar of the community, but on the inside of the family, he was molesting his daughter. And Phyllis was sexually abused all through her childhood, but her mother never knew. Now, when Phyllis gets her own kids... She would take all of her daughters to visit their grandfather, where he would abuse these girls, and then he would give her money. So they said when she needed money, she ran to her dad with her girls. So this is Louise's mom? Yes, Louise's mom, Phyllis, would take Louise, Elizabeth, and Teresa, her daughters, to be abused by her father. And what they said was during the visit with the girls, he would tell them they were going into the other room for a tight hug. And the girls would beg their mother not to go, but she would take them anyway. She said, I have to feed you. But in 1982, when Louise was 14, her grandmother caught her grandfather raping her on the living room couch. So she grabs a frying pan. She chases him out of the house and she is done with him. She immediately divorces him and the grandfather moves into his own home. Now, the girls were told by the adults in the family not to discuss it. It was over, so there was no need to ruin the family name, so it was not reported to the police, and it was a well-kept family secret. But it was not over. Phyllis would still bring her girls over to her father's house where he lived by himself, and we find out later not only did he abuse Phyllis's daughters, but he also abused some of their female cousins. Now, Elizabeth, the younger sister, said that whenever the grandfather wanted to give her the tight hug, that Louise would step up and take her place instead. When Louise's grandmother found out that her daughter Phyllis was still taking the girls over there, she told her to stop. But Phyllis didn't because her dad would give her money. So we can see that we got two people that live in the same community, but have very different upbringings. And... David and Luis, they knew each other all their lives because, like I said, they went, they lived in the same community and they went to this very conservative church together. Both of them attended the same church and everyone in that church was a small, tight knit group, you know, basically like a church family. When Luis was 15 and David was about 22 or 23, they kind of secretly started dating. Phyllis knew of the dating and encouraged it but would not tell Louise's father because he would not allow his young daughter to date a much older man. So Phyllis had approved of her secretly dating David because he was the Turpin boy, and he's a good boy from a good family. Most weekends, David would make the trip from Blacksburg, where he was in college, back to Princeton to see Louise. And in 1984, David received his bachelor's degree from Virginia Tech in electrical engineering, And that was just as Luis was entering the 10th grade. 
as a result of his degree in electrical engineering, David landed a good job with General Dynamics in Fort Worth, Texas. And that proposes a problem because Luis is young and, and still living in West Virginia, and so they develop a plan to run away together and elope. So one evening, Louise packs her bag, and the next morning, she rode the bus to school. David showed up at the school and disguised himself to look older. He wore a fake mustache and a cowboy hat, and he basically posed as her father to check her out of school, and he was able to do so, no questions asked. I would like to think that school security is a little tighter now, but he was able to check her out, no questions asked, and they drive... 1,100 miles to Fort Worth, Texas. When Luis didn't come home, her parents found out what happened. They went to the police, and the police located Luis in Fort Worth, Texas with David and made her call her parents. Her dad ordered her to return home so that they could have a proper wedding. He said she had made her choice but needed to do it properly. So on February 11th, 19. 85, they were married in Parisburg, Virginia, about 35 miles outside of Princeton, and only close family were invited. I don't think her family was really about the marriage, but once they had committed, dad wanted them to go all the way, I guess. They then returned to Fort Worth because he had the job there. It was obviously a lucrative job, and they began their lives together. Louise never went back to school, so that day in 10th grade when she left was pretty much it for her education. So let's talk about their life in Fort Worth. Like B said, David was making great money, and Louise was staying at home, but she would still write letters to her sister Elizabeth, and in these letters she talked about her hate for Princeton, West Virginia, and her resentment of her family, and that stemmed from the abuse. David and Louise would eat at expensive restaurants, and they liked going to the rodeo. Things weren't going so well back in West Virginia for her family, but she was living the good life. Well, they were in Fort Worth about two years, and then they moved to Brea, California. That was for his job, and Brea is about 33 miles southeast of Los Angeles in Orange County, Louise, although she deeply resented her family, she loved to tell them about her wealthy lifestyle and how they would frequently go to Disneyland and had several cars in their driveway to feed her own ego, I guess. She was telling her family, look at me, I got out. Louise had also told her sisters and her family that she wanted 12 children. And in July of 1988, at the age of 20, Louise gave birth to her first child, Jennifer Dawn Turpin. Well, now that Christmas, Louise and David, although she resented her family, they paid all expenses for Louise's mother, Phyllis, and her kids to come to California. And what Phyllis and the kids said is the house was nice and well kept. They stayed for three weeks, again, with David and Louise footing the bill, for trips to Disneyland, Universal Studios, and lots of eating out. So they stayed in Brea until early 1990 when David was transferred back to Fort Worth, Texas. And by this time, he's making a six-figure income. They loaded up with their 18-month-old daughter, Jennifer, and then and traveled back to Fort Worth and bought a four-bedroom, two-bath home just outside of Fort Worth city limits proper. David and Luis again invited Phyllis and her kids to visit, and that kind of started annual trips over the next 10 years. And of course, David and Luis foot all the bills for these trips, and they visit all the local hot spots and eat out and, you know, just have a good time. February 3rd, 1992, Luis gives birth to her second child, Joshua David Turpin. Shortly after this, David and Louise filed Chapter 7 bankruptcy. And I know the listeners are thinking, well, wait a minute, he's making six figures, they're having a family out, and sounds like everything's going good, at least financially. Well, not so much. They had racked up a ton of credit card debt because even though he was making good money, they were living way beyond their means. And both of them had kind of discovered gambling and may have developed somewhat of a gambling problem. 
Luis never mentioned this to her family. Obviously, she was real big on flaunting her lifestyle. We had talked about that, and she never mentioned any financial issues, and they still put together the money for the annual trips. On November 3rd, 1993, the third child, Jessica Louise Turpin, was born. A little over a year after Jessica's born, Jennifer starts the first grade where Louise would drive her and pick her up every day. Jennifer was picked on in school because of poor hygiene and she wore the same clothes to school every day. Her hair was long and greasy and never brushed and we know how kids can be and apparently Jennifer was picked on a lot. Teachers described her as unusually hyperactive and excitable and most people just thought that Jennifer's family was very poor. December 17th, 1995, Jonathan Wayne Turpin was born. So at this point, we got Jennifer, who's seven, Joshua, who's three, and Jessica, who's two, and now Jonathan Wayne Turpin being born. About six months after he's born, the family loads up and, and now goes to West Virginia to visit rather than having the family to their home in Fort Worth. They were all dressed identical and they treated their family lavishly with meals and, and trying to keep up this perfect family, perfect life image that they had made for themselves. And Louise's family later on says everybody thought that Louise and David had this perfect lifestyle. So while on that trip to Princeton, West Virginia, Elizabeth, who is Louise's younger sister, she was now in college. And she asked Louise and David if she could come spend the summer with them, and they welcomed her to do so. So she loaded up with them for the trip back to Fort Worth. Now, Elizabeth says as they were going through Louisiana, David got off an exit and asked Elizabeth to watch the kids while he and Louise went inside to gamble. She said it was several hours later when David and Louise finally came back to the vehicle and they had been arguing and David accused Louise of having a problem with gambling and wouldn't stop even when she was losing a lot of money. And Louise told David that she was not a child and to stop bossing her. Now, Elizabeth said she enjoyed spending time with her sister where they got to do things together. She did notice that the kids had to ask permission to go to the bathroom and eat. She also never saw any signs of affection or physical comfort between the parents and the kids. The meals they had were very ritualistic. Louise would put their plates on the table and call the kids one at a time. And Jennifer, being the oldest, had to look Louise in the eyes and smile and wait on Louise to smile back before she could be seated. And once seated, she still had to wait for permission to eat. After they ate, the kids were sent back to their rooms. And she said they were confined to their rooms for long periods of time. And they did not allow Elizabeth to have contact with the kids unless Louise or David was present. Louise told her this was because they didn't want Elizabeth's beliefs rubbing off on the kids. She said they had strict rules and Louise would decide the punishment with David carrying out the punishment. Elizabeth said she was only 19 years old at this time and really didn't know a whole lot about life and she didn't challenge David and Louise. She did say they both had bad tempers, and she even saw David physically attack Louise at one point. Well, while Elizabeth's there, she gets a summer job, but she had some strict rules at the house. Louise had to drive her to work and had to pick her up. She couldn't have any friends. She couldn't use David and Louise's home phone. She couldn't tell anyone their address or where they lived. And if she broke the rules, she would be kicked out. So Elizabeth said she followed the rules. She said that it became inappropriate in the house. She said when she was showering, Louise would pick the lock so Louise and David could enter the bathroom and would make Elizabeth get out with them watching. And they would laugh like it was a joke. But she felt very uncomfortable. But she said she was never touched inappropriately. It was just these incidents when she was taking a shower. So Louise finds out that Elizabeth made a friend and was having lunch with this friend, and she became furious. So one day, Louise drops Elizabeth off at her job, but didn't pick her up. 
and then she wouldn't answer the phone. So Elizabeth says she spent the next three nights sleeping outside until Louise finally answered the phone and told her to go back home. Well, Elizabeth said she had to threaten to call the police just to get her belongings from Louise's house. And with this threat, Louise gave in and let her come and collect her belongings. Well, May 21st of 1997, Joy Donna Turpin was born to Louise and David. And they're having more kids now, so just so you can keep up, this is baby number five. At this point, Jennifer is eight, Joshua is five, Jessica is three, and Jonathan is 18 months. Now, Jennifer was in second grade, and classmates and teachers said her hygiene seemed to become worse. She smelled dirty and like urine and always wore the exact same clothes every day. And even in front of classmates, she would touch her private area, which ended up with her being sent to see the principal, but there was no action taken. And they don't know if this could be signs of sexual abuse, but with lack of poor hygiene, it's more than likely that she had itching or irritation going on. And then June 15th of 1998, Julianne Phyllis Turpin was born to David and Louise, and this is baby number six. The next month, the family went back to Princeton, West Virginia to visit their families, and this was the last time that David and Louise would go to West Virginia. And then there were no more trips to their home for Louise's family. Now, by the end of that year, they were regularly going to Louisiana to gamble and it was causing some more financial issues. In spring of 1999, their home was foreclosed on and they were evicted. Jennifer, who was in third grade by now, just quit going to school. And what we learned later is none of the other kids would ever set foot in a private or public school. With Jennifer leaving the third grade, Louise, who dropped out of school at the age of 16 to get married, would be responsible for the education of her children. The people who bought this home of theirs that was foreclosed on could not believe the inside of the home. They said it was a terrible smell. The floors were just caked in filth. And then July 27th of 1999, Janetta Betty Turpin was born, child number eight, with Jennifer 11, Joshua 7, Jessica 5, Jonathan 3, Joy 2, Julianne 14 months. Right after their eviction, and this is going to be right after Janetta was born, David and Louise purchased a home in Rio Vista, Texas. Now, this is about 40 miles south of Fort Worth, and it's a very small community with about 740 residents. It was a four-bedroom, three-bath, and it had some acreage, about 2,300 square feet for the size of the house. There was a gas well on the property, so they got about $600 a month for mineral rights, which also provided additional income, and they lived there for about 10 years. The kids were not allowed to tell anyone their names or speak of anything that happened inside the home. The area was very rural, but they did have neighbors like right across the street, and the neighbors tried to befriend the Turpins like neighbors do. They went to their home several times, but no one would answer the door. So I kind of envision this like the welcoming committee. You move in and, you know, maybe the neighbor brings over food or something like that or invites you to a barbecue or something, but nobody's answering the door. Eventually, two of the neighbors that were also kids saw Jennifer, Joshua, and Jessica outside, but these kids went up to him and said, hey, you know, what y'all's names, you know, trying to befriend them and the kids wouldn't tell them their names. So the neighbors begin to think, obviously, that the family's mysterious. They would see David leave every morning in a Mustang. And sometimes they would see Louise load up kids in a minibus to go to town and back. So they see them coming and going, but they don't ever really have any interaction with the neighbors. Louise would often take some of the kids when she went to get groceries, but otherwise the neighbors reported they never really saw the kids leaving the house. No one ever went into the home, except for only twice in the 10 years that they lived there, and that was a child who was a neighbor that entered through the back door, and there were animal cages and newspapers with feces everywhere, and the house just reeked of feces and filth. 
And this neighbor was allowed in through the back door, but not allowed past the kitchen and dining area. The neighbor said the kids were really friendly, but they were got very quiet when their mother was outside. During one event, the neighbor introduced herself to two of the girls when they were outside. And she said that one of the girls said, if you pay attention to what we say, maybe you can figure out our names. And that made the other little girl scared. And she said, no, don't. So shortly after this event, the neighbor went to the home to see if the kids could come out and play. And Luis answered the door. And she told this neighbor child that they could no longer come out and play and shut the door. The other children in the neighborhood are beginning to pick up on what's going on there. And things seem to get worse from this point on. David and Luis start punishing the children by slapping and hitting. And that was more than just corporal punishment. It ended up escalating to being thrown around the room. And then they moved on to a belt where they would use the leather strap part. But if that didn't change the behavior enough, they would use the buckle on their lower back and buttocks and like their upper legs. And if that didn't work, they had what they called the switch. And the switch was a metal tent stick, like a tent pole, which was wrapped in fiberglass and it had metal tips on the end. Both parents were involved in the punishment, but the kids preferred Louise to punish them because she wasn't as physically strong as David. And that makes sense because he could probably hit harder than she could. The parents absolutely forbade any bathing or taking of showers. If they washed above their wrists, they were said to be playing with water and would be tied or chained up. They converted the den of the home into a schoolroom with eight desks, but by all accounts, there was very little to no schooling that went on. David bought cows, goats, chickens, and pigs and attempted some type of farming. Don't know that he was very successful with that. In November of 2000, Jordan was born, and this is baby number nine. We move on to summer of 2001. Four-year-old Joy was bitten by the family dog, a border collie. And a day later, David called 911 to get help for her, and she was taken to the hospital. Now, the reason this is such an issue is a dog had not had its rabies shot. The dog had to be taken to the vet and put down. A report was done, but no one ever visited the home. Christmas of 2001, James and Betty Turpin went to visit their son at the Rio Vista home in Texas, and they claimed that they never saw anything out of the way. The kids seemed fine. A few months after that, Louise's half-brother Billy came to visit, and Louise was pregnant, and he said that they had an affluent lifestyle, but they were strict with the kids, but nothing that he deemed abuse. The kids all dressed identical and would have to get in a single file line before getting on to the minibus. And he acknowledged that he saw the schoolroom with the books and said his nieces and nephews were standoffish and didn't make eye contact. It was the last time he was ever invited for a visit to the Texas home. In 2002, Joanna was born, so now we're at baby number 10. Also during their time in Rio Vista, Louise's father, Alan, came for one visit, and it'd be the last time he ever saw the family. Yeah, I guess in lieu of having them visit, Louise sent photos of the kids, and they were always smiling and dressed in matching outfits. Teresa, Louise's sister, said she had not seen Louise and the kids in five years, but commented to Louise that the kids looked thin, and Louise said they were all just lanky like David. Now, David and Louise, they carried on this lifestyle or tried to carry on the affluent lifestyle, and they continued to eat out regularly at local restaurants, but never with the kids. They think about it, Christmas of 2002, David and Louise bought 10 kids' bicycles, and they were expensive. They lined them up under the carport with a large price tag still on them, and those bikes sat there for years never being used or with the tags removed so it's like we buy these christmas presents but we never even really give them to the kids and the bikes just sit there for years with their tags hanging on them well now let's move forward to may of 2004 where they're still living on this property in texas but one day a brand new double wide mobile home shows up which they purchased for sixty three thousand dollars and they moved it onto the property behind the house. It was about 150 feet, I think, behind the house. 
and the family all abandoned the house and they moved into the mobile home. And from this point on, the neighbors said that they did not see the kids again, but they would hear them playing in the rear yard, but it was always at night. Also in 2004, Jolinda was born, and this is baby number 11. The summer after Jolinda was born, James and Betty Turpin came to Texas for another five-day visit. In 2006, Julissa was born, and now we're at baby number 12. Louise finally had these 12 children that she wanted, and it took her a 17-year period to have 12 children. After moving into this mobile home, David had built a cage to imprison anyone who broke the rules of the house. And this was a metal cage. It was about seven feet wide by five feet tall, but it was divided in half to hold two kids at one time. It had a pegboard style siding on it. And you know the pegboards, it's the thin pieces of wood that have the little holes in them that you can put hooks in to hang tools and that kind of thing on. This is what lined that cage. There was about a five-inch gap at the bottom where food could be slid in to feed the kids. And the kids would be locked in this cage for days at a time. But eight-year-old Jonathan figured out that he could just lift up the bottom of the cage and escape. So David decides to up his game and bought a three-foot by three-foot metal dog kennel. Now, after the rescue, Joshua, the oldest son, says that he was locked in the kennel for a day when Louise caught him watching Star Wars. So they had very, very strict rules. Also, by this point, Skype was becoming a thing. And Louise learned about this video calling, and she would Skype with her family. And a lot of the family said this was the first time they had ever seen all of the kids, but they only saw one or two of them at a time on Skype. And they said the kids were friendly, but somewhat awkward. However, over the next few years, Louise would Skype less and less and started making excuses why she couldn't. Also during this time frame that they were living on this property in Texas, I'm going to tell you about another location in Texas, and it's called Benbrook, Texas. So after they moved the family into this trailer, David and Louise rented an apartment in Benbrook, and that's about 40 miles away from their home. One day, they loaded up Julissa and Jolinda, which were the two youngest, and they moved into this apartment, leaving all the other kids behind. They put Jennifer and Joshua in charge of all the other kids, and every few days, David would drop all frozen food, but they never saw their mother. And as you can imagine, when you leave 10 kids alone living in a home, the conditions became even more horrific. But they still had these rules. They were still forbidden to wash above their wrist. They had pets in the home with them, and the pets would use the bathroom inside. And the smell was probably just unbearable. And there was never medical treatment for anybody. David and Louise would control the kids over the phone. They said Joshua was in charge of changing diapers and Jennifer was in charge of preparing meals. Jennifer and Joshua would be directed to lock the children in cages when they broke the rules. And they did it because they knew if they didn't lock the kids up when, when told to do so, that the parents would come and lock Jennifer and Joshua up. Well, early one morning, Jennifer decided she wanted to escape. So she runs across the neighbor's property and goes to the road, and another neighbor picked her up. Now, she refused to give her name or her age, but she asked how she could get a job, an apartment, and a car. So the neighbor drives her to town, but without a driver's license or ID, of course, she wasn't able to get a job. And I don't think she really even knew how to go about it or had any prospects of getting a job. And, of course, she realized she was in over her head, so she called her mother, and Louise came and picked her up and returned her to the home to continue taking care of the children. Now, Hill County Sheriff's Office, which is the jurisdiction where their home was, nor the Department of Family Services had record of any of this, so most likely nobody reported anything. And before we move on, I'm sure some of the listeners are wondering 
wait a minute, if the two oldest kids are in charge of taking care of all these younger kids, I mean, why weren't there more escape attempts made? But what we see is that huge level of psychological control. These kids are conditioned to living this way and conditioned to not question what their parents say or anything like that. I mean, their parents are essentially able to control this over the phone. It, it's hard to imagine, but that's created an environment where the kids, not only do they lack the practical skills and abilities to leave, it's like, okay, we made it outside. What do we do now? Uh, but they also have this strong psychological hold that their parents have over them. Yeah, and the way they're raised, they don't know anything different. That is their normal. That is very normal for them. Louise, as if it could get any worse, just continues to spiral out of control. In 2008, she celebrates her 40th birthday, and at this time, that makes David 47. She spoke to her sister and said that she had begun looking into snake handling and witchcraft. She was drinking a lot in bars around town, and they had decided they were going to have an open marriage. Luis dyed her hair red and began wearing heavy makeup. And during this time, she claims that she got drunk for the first time in her life. Their strict Christian upbringing, her family says Louise never drank. She never smoked. I mean, she never even used a cuss word. So it was very strict. So this is a complete turnaround of what she, the way she grew up. Oh, yeah, complete because they abandoned their church life. They're no longer going to church, didn't want to bring their kids up in the church and started openly stating that she didn't trust church people. They also started going to Las Vegas regularly and they would just leave the kids behind. She told her sister the older kids were helping with the younger kids so that she and David can go. And we, we talked about earlier how they had a big gambling problem. And obviously Las Vegas is the mecca for gambling. So they start going to Las Vegas and just leaving the kids behind. She admitted that she and David were swingers and that they were kind of sowing their wild oats. And at one point, they drove 700 miles from Texas to Huntsville, Alabama to hook up with a man that they had met online. David waited outside while Luis went into the hotel room and had sex with the man. She recorded it on her camcorder so that David could watch it later. One year later, to the date, she and David drove back to Huntsville, went to the same hotel room because David wanted to have sex with her in that bed. So you can see their behavior is just becoming more and more odd and they are still running up credit card debt in las vegas they would stay at caesar's palace and buy expensive toys for the kids which like the bicycles never made it to the kids david bought a new mustang every year plus a ford focus and a ford econoline van all on credit obviously he's a big mustang fan he buys one every year and then buys a new family van and like most people, he's having to carry a lien on that. The problem is, is that he's got a ton of credit card debt. In fact, in 2010, their situation got even worse because David lost his job with Lockheed Martin, but he still bought the Mustang for that year with $22,000 on credit. Then he just quit paying for the vehicles. These compounding financial problems on April 5th, 2010, they're given notice that their property is being foreclosed on again. So they went back to the mobile home, collected all the kids and left. They left the dogs in inside the house and all the other animals, you know, from David's failed attempt at farming, the pigs and goats and chickens, they just left them on the property. A few weeks later, the neighbor went over to see what was going on and heard a dog barking. So he opened the door and two chihuahuas ran out and those dogs had survived by eating the dirty diapers in the home. The neighbor went into the home and described the scene as unbelievable. Just floors covered in feces and uh, a bedroom set up like a military barracks that had six bunk beds stacked in a row with ropes tied to the headboards. The, Closet doors, toy chest, refrigerator, anywhere a kid might go to look for something all had padlocks on it. They also went into the home at the front of the property. You remember they had put that trailer behind the home. So they went into the home that the family vacated 
and it was infested with bugs and rats and they saw a dead cat in the kitchen and a dead dog in the floor and other wild animal corpses. I mean, it had just been taken over. The home was bought out of foreclosure to be used as a rental, but the, the new owners had to spend $30,000 just to get it back to livable conditions. So in June of 2010, now April 5th is when they were given foreclosure and May is when they loaded up the kids. In June of 2010, the Turpin family moved to Southern California and they rented a home in Merida, California, which is about 65 miles north of San Diego. And it was a almost 2,500 square foot home with five bedrooms, three baths and a loft, along with two large living rooms. Now, the kitchen was off limits to the kids. They had told the kids they were moving back there for David's work, but he was still unemployed. But he was still receiving these nearly $600 a month royalty checks for the mineral rights on the land that had been foreclosed on. And in fact, it took them a year to figure out that David no longer owned that property to cut off the checks. And they pretty much survived on credit. So David went about six months without a job. In January 2011, David got a job as a computer engineer with Northrop Grumman, which is a major defense contractor, and it's located in San Diego. And with this job, he was making $143,000 a year. But in July of that year, they were so underwater that they filed for Chapter 7 bankruptcy, owing nearly a quarter of a million dollars. As part of the bankruptcy, David was allowed to keep his 2010 Mustang as collateral and made a $425 a month payment on it, but all their other debts are erased. Now, with David's new job, he worked 2 p.m. until 10 p.m., so he was on the evening shift. The neighbors said they noticed strange behavior between about midnight and 3 a.m., the kids would be marching forward and backward, almost military style, and also marching in circles in the hallway of the upstairs of the home. And they could see it because the blinds were open and all the lights were on. He said it was really odd. He only saw them during the day once when two of the girls came outside to check the mail and he tried to say hi, but they wouldn't look at him and went back inside. Now, he thought that they might be disabled or possibly autistic, and that's why they stayed inside and seemed kind of odd. They would see them loading up in the van around 1 a.m. every few weeks during the three years that they lived there. This neighbor even said he thought that they might be some kind of cult or possibly the parents were selling the kids, and that's why they're loading them up at 1 a.m. Over the next few years, while they're living in this home in Merida, Louise's sister and her half-brother made plans to visit several times, but every time it was canceled at the last minute by Louise. In July of 2011, David's brother, the Reverend Randy Turpin, along with his wife and their five kids, went to California to visit the family, and all these families went together to Disneyland. During their time in Merida, David officially filed to open the City Day School, where he was designated as the principal. And this was filed so they could homeschool the kids and wouldn't be questioned about why the kids were not in school. And in his paperwork, he claimed eight children were in school, grades 2 to 11, and it was a private full-time school. But because there were over six students, this opened up to them having an annual inspection by the local fire marshal, but over the next eight years of him filing that he had his own private school, there was not a single inspection. In 2011, David and Louise went to Las Vegas to renew their wedding vows after 26 years of marriage, and they spared no expense. And this is after their bankruptcy. They got what was called the Hound Dog Package with an Elvis impersonator who conducted the ceremony. But this was not the last time that they would renew their vows in that chapel. And, of course, they left the kids back at home. While they were there, they went gambling. And at one point, Louise caused some kind of scene and the security got involved. Obviously, they had arguments about the gambling. That Christmas, David's parents came to California to visit again. And they said the kids were healthy, well-adjusted. They were not skinny. 
the parents were staying in the home with David and Louise, so they were seeing the kids daily. During their trip, they ate out, they went to Disneyland, and David's parents said they were the model Christian family. So in the spring of 2012, Alan Robinette, now that's Louise's father, he retired and he flew to California to surprise his daughter. And when he gets to the San Diego airport, he calls her, but she refuses to give him her address and told him to go home. We do know in 2013 that several, if not all of the kids became sick and it got bad enough that David and Louise had to take them to Loma Linda University Medical Center for treatment. And this was highly unusual on their part, so they had to have been very sick for them to take them to the hospital. But they were all coached and taught what to say to the doctors. September of 2013, David and Louise go back to Vegas for another wedding vow renewal. And this time, they took all of the kids. They had nine daughters, ages 8 to 25, with identical dresses and shoes, Three boys, ages 9 to 21, with matching suits, and their haircuts matched their dad. They all looked very, very thin. And you can see these pictures online, and I'm also going to post them on our website. Before leaving home for this trip to Vegas, all the kids got to bathe and wash their hair for the first time in months. When they entered the chapel, they walked in a single file, they said that during the ceremony, David was crying. That Thanksgiving, Louise was out of the house and only David was home with the kids. And Jordan, the one that called 911, said her father called her over to where he was sitting in his recliner and pulled down her pants. She said she pulled them back up, but he pulled them down again, and then he pulled her to sit in his lap. But then they heard Louise arrive home, so Jordan jumped up and pulled up her pants. Jordan says her father ordered her to never talk about what happened. She said he never tried anything again, but he would try to force kisses on her mouth over the next few years. An incident that happened in April of 2014, Louise called Janetta, who was 14, playing with her Barbie doll, and she ordered her to stand in the corner of the bathroom. And so Janetta's been in, standing in the corner of the bathroom for a couple of hours, and she started to feel bad. She called Joanna, her sister, and Joanna went to Louise to try to tell her Janetta wasn't feeling good. But Joanna got in trouble for interrupting Louise while she was on the phone. Well, during this time, Janetta fell out unconscious onto the floor. So once Louise finishes her phone call, she goes up to the bathroom to make sure Janetta was still standing in the corner and found her on the floor covered in blood. An hour later, Louise took Janetta to Loma Linda University Medical Center, but Janetta was told to tell the doctors that she slipped on the wet bathroom floor. Now, from this visit, Janetta had a hairline fracture in her jaw and broken teeth. She was told to return in a few days for follow-up, but she never returned. So after the move to California, the abuse seemed to escalate. The kids were confined to their rooms, tied to furniture, but the treatment did become a little bit better for the older kids, specifically Jennifer and Joshua. Joshua was allowed to have a camera and Jennifer was allowed a smartphone. And this is probably because they were depending on them so heavily to take care of the other kids. After Louise had had this sowing her wild oat phase where she met up with a person in Huntsville and did the snake handling and all that other stuff. She became the dominant physical abuser. She was angry all of the time and all of the kids were just terrified of her. The kids were only allowed out of their rooms to use their restroom, eat and brush their teeth. Exercise was banned and they were spending about 20 hours a day in their bedrooms. I mean, it's almost like being in prison really. They would wake up at about 11 p.m. and go to bed around 3 a.m. So they did nothing but really just kind of lay around and sleep. They were fed minimally. They didn't eat very much, and they were on a schedule. They had no access to TV, radio, newspaper. That slowed down their progression, obviously, and, and gave them even less understanding of how the world outside worked. Their world was their house where they were held captive. 
However, they encouraged them to keep journals, which seems strange to me because it seems like these kids would be writing down things that could then be later used against the parents were they to ever be discovered. But the journals, because of the lack of education and, and lack of natural progression, their reading and writing skills were severely lacking. And while they were living in California, some of the daughters were caught using Louise's makeup and trying on her clothes. David demanded that all 12 of the kids be chained up, and he saw that as the only way to stop this bad behavior. Louise didn't agree with David on this, and she said that only the offenders should be locked up, and she even referred to them as the suspects. Jonathan who's 15 at this time, he's usually a suspect in most of the offenses around the house. He got hogtied, but was able to escape. And for those not familiar, hogtying is like when a person's laid on their stomach, their hands are bound together and their feet are bound together. And then their feet and hands are bound to each other. So it makes it very difficult to move. He was also chained to the bed rail with padlocks, and but he was kind of an escape artist. He was able to slide out of the chains, so his parents just kept using heavier chains and making them tighter. Until their rescue, Jonathan stayed chained up for weeks and months at a time. He was so frequently a suspect, I guess. Luis would punish the girls by giving them a pitching, which is where she would throw them around the room by their hair. She also choked them and hit them in the head, slapped them in the face. I mean, just very, very abusive. When Joanna was seven, Louise caught her in the master bedroom, which was, I'm sure, off limits. And she began tossing her around and threw her down the stairs. Now, she claimed that her neck and back hurt and she was dizzy, but there was no medical intervention on this. Late 2010, Louise posted a picture on Facebook, and it was of all the kids there standing there holding these homeschool diplomas that she had ordered online. We know now that the kids never received any real education through a public or private school or even a homeschool thing. And in the picture, all of the kids looked very thin. Also, during this time in California, Louise came up with a grand idea. We know that Louise was a fan of TLC's show Kate Plus Eight about the Goslins where they had, she had eight kids and she told her family that this was one of the reasons for their return to California. She said that their family was perfect for television and they would be bigger than Kate Plus Eight. So she began to post pictures on Facebook and these were in an attempt to draw attention to get their own reality show and it was of all the family in their matching outfits with matching haircuts so a month after janetta's injury if you'll remember because we've talked about a lot of injuries and back and forth with a bunch of different kids that was the child that had stood in the corner until she fell down and basically passed out where they told the doctor that she had fallen down getting out of a wet shower if you recall that one a month after that injury they bought a brand new four-bedroom home in paris california for three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. and at this point it's just incredible to me that they're able to still buy anything financially uh, only by virtue of his high income i guess that's the only thing because i mean they have had a terrible financial life. They uh, obviously left the rental home in a terrible mess, which I'm sure that comes as a shock to nobody. It had to be fumigated before it could be rented out again. Louise encouraged her favorite children, Jennifer, Joshua, and Julianne, and Janetta, to spy on the other kids and kind of gave them gifts and incentives. She called them the hall monitors. They were the only ones allowed out of the house. It was only when Luis was going shopping or had errands. The hall monitors had to guard the kitchen on a constant basis to keep anyone from stealing food. And like I said, they were afforded these extra privileges. Joshua was allowed to watch TV with his parents. Jennifer was allowed social media accounts on her cell phone until she downloaded an app that Luis did not approve of and the phone was taken away. I told you earlier about the children's sleep schedules, and they were kind of forced into this nocturnal lifestyle of going to bed at 4 or 5 a.m. and waking up at 10 or 11 p.m. But, I mean, if you spend all day or most of your day in your room or indoors, I mean, you kind of lose track of, 
of time and a natural, I guess, biorhythm. They were all, as we've said before, confined to specific areas of the home. One bedroom had Jordan, Julissa, Joanna, and Jolinda. And then another bedroom had Julianne, Janetta, Joy, and Jessica. And a third bedroom was for Jennifer, Joshua, Jonathan, and James. Each bedroom had two sets of bunk beds with padlocks on each bed. No one could leave the room without the permission of David or Luis. And when they were given permission, it was usually only to go to the bathroom and to the kitchen to eat when it was their turn. Remember, they had this weird ritual for eating. Exercising, still strictly forbidden. And the only time they socialized with each other was when their parents were out of the home. They snuck out of their rooms because otherwise they were forbidden contact with each other. So not only do you have this isolation period, but I mean, you've got isolation within the home from your own siblings. So if they weren't your roommates in this situation, you didn't get to have any contact with them unless the parents were out of the home. There was internet and a phone in the home, but they were all too afraid of their parents and they were also afraid of the outside world with such little exposure to what's going on outside of that house. They didn't know what was out there. They were scared. Yeah, it seems everything would be scary to them. The parents had, had trained them that the, the outside world was to be feared. When they would take a trip for a wedding renewal or to Disneyland or when other family would visit, the kids, like we said before, walked in a line in order of their ages with David in front and Luis in back. Have so just a very strange regimented lifestyle. Initially, they were fed lunch and dinner during their waking hours, but then it was combined into one meal because we said they weren't enough awake long enough basically to eat two meals. They're only awake four or five hours a day. All meals were prepared by Jennifer and only when told to do so by Luis. They were called in one at a time in order and had to eat standing up by the kitchen counter and drank water from the faucet. Every meal they had for years was either peanut butter sandwich, bologna sandwich, or a frozen burrito and chips. After they ate, they were sent straight back to their room. David and Luis continued to eat out while the kids were having to stay at home and eat this regimented lifestyle where they only ate these foods that we listed. David and Luis bought pies and sat them on the counter where kids could see them, but not allow them to eat. And the pies would just go bad and have to be thrown away. Abuse, the level of abuse. I mean, it's almost like they're taunting them. Yeah, the psychological abuse. They were only allowed to bathe once a year. Bed linens were not ever washed, even though by virtue of the fact that they're chained up in their beds, I mean, you have to know that their beds are going to get sold because they're chained up there. David continued to register as private school, but once in Paris, he named it Sandcastle Day School. When Joshua was 22, he enrolled in a music course at Mount San Jacinto College. Over the next three years, he would take courses in algebra, English, public speaking, and was an honor student. That's weird. I know. It's, it's amazing that... He obviously had a natural intelligence to him like his father and was able to learn these things. Luis would drive Joshua to school and would either wait in the hallway or buy her vehicle for him to finish class and drive home. Now, he still wore the same clothes every day. He was really pale and just odd and appeared malnourished. Others tried to talk to him, but he wouldn't talk back. However... After six semesters, another student spoke to Joshua and said she didn't have any friends either. So in front of this girl, Joshua asked Luis if he could be friends with her. And Luis said, sure. Joshua never returned to college. Now that they are settled in Paris, Luis becomes pregnant with baby number 13. And in early 2015, Jana was born when Linda was 47 years old. Now, baby Jana was a redhead, and Louise would post Facebook pictures of herself with Jana or David and Louise and Jana, but not with the other kids. And when people would ask about pictures of the other kids, she would just say, oh, they're all hard to gather up at one time for a picture. After Jana's born that fall, they go back to Vegas to renew their wedding vows. And again, they brought all of the kids for their 30th wedding anniversary and renewal. 
In early 2016, Jennifer let Jordan, now Jordan's the one who later calls 911, and Jennifer's the oldest. She let Jordan use her cell phone to go online, and Jordan's 15 at the time. But Joshua caught her and told Louise. Louise went into a rage and choked Jordan and asked her if she wanted to die and was saying, yes, you do want to die and go to hell. Jordan says her neck was sore for several days after that. After this, she did try to escape one other time, but she saw her mom coming, so she rushed back inside. Around Christmas, Jonathan, Jolinda, Julissa, and Jeanette were caught stealing food from the kitchen, so they were chained up. And at Christmas, they had this thing that was called the good treatment, and it would last anywhere from two days to two weeks, and they were fed more, they were able to interact with one another, they were able to spend time with their parents, but then after this good time or this good treatment, it went back to the old ways. Because these four were caught stealing food from the kitchen, they didn't get the good treatment that Christmas. They were allowed to be unchained in order to watch the others get the good treatment, and then they were chained back up. On Mother's Day of 2017, they were all allowed to bathe for the first time in a year. They were then all dressed alike, and they took a photo, which was, again, put on Facebook. But as soon as they finished the photo, they had to put back on their soiled clothes. They still refused to give their address to any family members. Louise's mother had gotten sick, and Phyllis was on her deathbed, but Louise refused to talk to her and even refused to attend her funeral because she said she had already planned a trip to Vegas. When Louise's father died, she said she couldn't attend the funeral because it was too short of a notice. So in December of 2017, Joshua gives Jordan his old cell phone because he got a new one, and the service had been disconnected on it, but she could access through Wi-Fi the internet, and Jordan began setting up social media accounts under the name Lacey Swan. And she began chatting online with a boy in India, and she disclosed to this child in India about her life, and his name was Nalesh Potbar. He encouraged her to escape and alert the authorities. On January 7th, 2018, Jordan posted her final video. Three days later, Louise tells her half-brother that they were planning to have a 14th baby because they needed an even bigger family because they are still trying to sell this reality show to TLC. And wouldn't it have been something if TLC would have actually <laughs> come to see what was going on? But right before Christmas, David found out that his job was being transferred to Oklahoma City, so they spent their holidays packing for the next move. And on January 14th, 2018, as we mentioned earlier, that is when... Jordan escaped and called police. So Jordan knew that the year was 2018 and that they were in the first month, but she did not know the name of the month nor the day of the week. When the police get to the home, they see vehicles with license plates showing David and Louise's love for Disney, one with DL Forever and the other one was DSL Land, the tags on the vehicles. When police enter the home, Jonathan is still chained up. And just prior to the police entering the home, Louise had one of the older daughters run into the bedroom and unchain Julissa and Joanna and throw the chains in the closet. They had been chained up since October. So going on 90 days and they get unchained as the police are entering the house. The chains were wrapped around their wrists like bracelets and then around the bedposts. The police noted that the kids were all dirty and smelled horrible and determined that they had not changed clothes in seven months. The parents could give no logical reason as to why the kids were chained. Both Jen and I have a law enforcement background, as we've said before on this program, and I just, I couldn't imagine being the responding officers to this. This is one of those things where it takes everything that the responding officer has not to lose their patience and temper. Could you imagine standing in this house talking to her and her not being able to provide any, there is no justification. There's never a logical reason sure. to chain up a child. But for her to just stand there and be like, well, I don't know. I mean, they're, they're chained up and everything. I mean, the officers 
certainly should be commended on their self-control. Yeah, and and I think people need to realize police officers have human reactions too. And the one thing, no matter how long an officer has a career, the things that you remember are things involving children. And and you know, y'all heard me talk about it before. That's where my heart is. You do something to a child, an elderly person or a disabled person, I mean, it's all over for me. I mean, it's just that is the hardest thing for me to accept. And Luis told police that she was confused as to why they were even in their home. Obviously, David and Luisa are going to be arrested, and they need to be. They were arrested on nine counts of torture, 10 counts of child endangerment, and held on a bond of $9 million each, which, to me, the nine counts of torture and 10 counts of child endangerment, boy, that's really, that's really, it's hard to encapsulate these children's entire lives into those 19 counts things that happen to them every day well and they can only charge them for the crimes that occurred in that jurisdiction sure so when police led them out of the home in handcuffs david was crying uncontrollably but louise was acting strange and emotionless and even was smirking at the officers according to them the adult siblings were taken to one hospital and the children to another and that makes sense because you had different medical facilities for that specialize in adults versus kids, these children had to be put in their own wings of the hospital with 24-hour guards. They had gone through so much that the police were taking no chances and they were going to make sure that they were safe. I'm going to get into talking about the results of the exams once the all these, I, I keep calling them kids, even though the majority of them are adults, but once all these kids are at the hospital, and it's hard to hear, but the reason we do the podcast that we do is because we need to remember these victims and hearing this not only is going to make you remember the victims, but it's also going to put that notion in your head. If you see something, say something. Here's the results. They said all but the toddler were 20 to 50 pounds underweight. The adult siblings had cachexia, which is the wasting away of the muscles and loss of muscle tone jennifer was 29 and jessica who was 24 would probably never be able to have children so 29 year old jennifer was five foot three and 80 pounds she had low cognition inability to perform mental tasks malnutrition acute b12 deficiency tingling weakness and numbness in the hands and feet from peripheral neuropathy joshua he was five foot eight 115 pounds he had severe iron and vitamin d deficiency now jessica joy and juliana were severely underweight and had the malnutrition cachexia and vitamin deficiency jonathan the 22 year old Remember, he was usually one of the suspects, but at 22, he has the same things as his sisters with the underweight, malnutrition, cachexia, and vitamin deficiency. But he also had skeletal abnormalities caused by years of restraints from the ropes and chains. He was five foot seven and 100 pounds, which was 47 pounds below weight. Janetta, surprisingly, was not underweight but she had slow cognition neuropathy severe protein caloric malnutrition severe iron and vitamin d deficiency jordan james and jalissa were the worst of the younger ones now you know when we take our babies any mother knows you want to know what percentile your kid is like my kids in the 50th percentile so i'm going to give you those percentiles so jalissa the 11 year old her body weight percentile was 0.01, and normal would be between 5 on the low end and 85 on the high end, but she was 0.01. Her height was 0.79, so these are way below where they should be. Jalissa's mid-upper arm circumference was the same as a four-month-old. She was anemic. She had severe muscle wasting, low potassium and glucose levels. Her heart was damaged, 
and because of the extreme malnutrition, her liver was also damaged. She had psychosocial dwarfism, which is basically stunted growth due to factors other than genetic. James, who was 15, his weight, 0.01 percentile. Height, 1.4 percentile. His muscles were so weak, he had an abnormal gait and difficulty walking. He had a vitamin D deficiency, visible scoliosis where his back was even in an S shape. And he also exhibited antisocial behavior. He had told the doctor he wanted to kill animals and he believed his dreams could predict the future. Now, Jordan, our 17-year-old who called 911, she was just over 94 pounds. She had a protein calorie malnutrition, muscle wasting, mild scoliosis, and as we could hear, she was very childlike for her age. And she needed speech therapy as she was somewhat difficult to understand. Jolinda, the 13-year-old, had severe malnutrition and muscle wasting. Her weight was in the 0.04 percentile and her height 0.01 percentile. Just to give you an understanding, with her weight being 0.04, which is a little bit more than the other siblings, she's 13, but her weight is that of a 7-year-old. She was very small, and she showed no normal signs of puberty for a girl of her age, such as breast development. For those of us who aren't moms and don't really understand the percentile thing, basically what you're saying is is that 99.96% of the population her age weighed more than she did. That's correct. Joanna, who was 11, her weight was again 0.01 percentile. Her height was 0.81 percentile. Vitamin D deficiency, potassium deficiency. They said after 10 days in the hospital, this 11-year-old put on almost 8 pounds after 10 days which a child her age would normally put on eight pounds in a year. Sure, they're probably being able to eat for the first time, really. And Jana, the two-year-old, she was the best fed, but her weight was 7.5 percentile and her height 7.18 percentile. So she's still at the very, very low end. So she's two years old. She weighs 25 and a half pounds. And they said over the next three months, she gained three pounds. The doctors also said that they would have to slowly start feeding them because they had gone in this state of malnutrition for so long. If they just start feeding them normal, they would have some problems for that. They would probably gorge themselves like nonstop, you would think. Oh, they would probably binge eat. Yeah. 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 Um, The doctor said they had long-term psychological and psychiatric issues that they all most likely suffered PTSD. None of the adult siblings looked like adults, and they even had to be bought children-sized clothing. The doctor said they would need lots of a long-term and probably lifetime support for any chance at even a halfway normal life. It's amazing just hearing all those numbers and statistics. It's amazing that that they all survived. Really, I can't believe that of the 13 that none of them passed away. Well, I will tell you, in the investigation, the police did bring cadaver dogs in the home to search for signs that one of the children could have died. And they even did that at the home in Texas, brought cadaver dogs there. Because, I mean, you would think that all these children on the verge of death, that somebody had died along the way. Well, sure. And as amazing as it is that they all survived, all that does for me really is just make me ready to see these people go to jail, honestly. The police begin the investigation by conducting a neighborhood canvas. And we've talked about how secretive they were and people on the street that they lived on couldn't provide much information. Neighbors said that they saw one or two kids at a time and that the kids were not friendly and seemed to avoid contact with the neighbors. No one suspected that there was 13 kids living in the home. In fact, when questioned by police, the neighbors estimated that there were no more than three kids living there. 
one neighbor stated that she saw a boy digging in the neighbor's trash, but didn't know what to make of it. I, I don't know. She must not have realized that he may have been looking for food or who knows. When they did see the kids outside, the mom would stand there watching them, just kind of lording over them. Two neighbors talked about how white and pale the kids were and how they only came out at night. And they joked that they were like the Cullen family, the vampire family from the Twilight movies. Every one of the neighbors recognized that this was a strange family, but it never occurred to them that people were being abused in the way that they were. So let's talk some more about the police investigation. I already told you about the cadaver dogs they brought to search for possible human remains. But when they searched the home, they, they found some odd things. Like there were hundreds of DVDs stacked to the ceiling in the garage, and they were alphabetized. And they included every season of Cake Plus 8, Disney cartoons, and horror movies. There were numerous unopened toys and gifts in the garage for kids. Now, the kids would be shown these gifts and these toys, but they were not allowed to touch them. And again, this is psychological torture for kids. Louise had thousands of items of clothing for herself, and a lot of them still had the tags on them. Now, the teenagers we know had one item of clothing each plus one set of pajamas. They also found where Louise had kept a list of who had lost good treatment at Christmas, and some had lost Christmas until 2021, and we're talking 2018 when they found the list. And the media quickly dubbed this house as the House of Horrors, and I think that is very fitting. Now, David and Louise's families obviously know the situation, and they know that these charges have been brought against their children, and David's parents didn't believe the charges, and they claimed that they had just visited four or five years earlier, and the kids were fine. The police asked why David and Louise had so many kids, and they said that God had called on them. David and Louise's parents then hire a lawyer in Princeton for themselves, not for David and Louisa, and they shut down contact with the media. Now, Louise's family didn't mind talking. Immediately after the arrest, Louise's sisters, Elizabeth and Teresa, went on several national media outlets, Dr. Phil, Dr. Oz, and, and other shows, telling their story about the sexual abuse that occurred to them and Luis as a child and how they saw nothing going on with the children when they were allowed contact. Both Teresa and Elizabeth wrote books de detailing their lives and the events. I did not read their books. And a lot, if not the majority of our research for this case, came from John Glatt's book, The Family Next Door. And he does have quotes in there from Teresa and Elizabeth. But Again, I didn't read their books. I didn't feel it was going to add anything other than what we already knew or what I could find from this book and online articles. So Dr. Oz went as far as to fly Elizabeth and Teresa to California so that they could visit Louise and David in jail. And when they got there, they said that Louise was in complete denial. She cried at first, but didn't even ask about the kids. She asked them to visit David because he never got visitors and she felt that she had done nothing wrong. When they visited David, they said he was remorseful and cried the entire time. They tried to go visit the kids in the hospital, but they were turned away. And I completely agree with that. These kids don't need any contact with any of these family members, it sounds like. Yeah, not, not at this point. That would probably be a decision that they need to make. So the prosecutor, when asked about the case, he said that most of the children and adults could barely read and write. And we've talked about that. The prosecutor said that most of what they had learned had come from the few educational posters that were in the schoolroom and what they could from each other. Jennifer was initially the most educated with a third grade education, and she tried to teach the younger kids. Most of the kids and young adults did not know the alphabet, and those who did did not know all of it. They were so poorly fed that their growth was stunted, and they had suffered permanent physical and cognitive damage. He got a protective order to keep the parents from contacting the children, which I'm sure was not difficult to do. He said that they were able to fly under the radar and go unnoticed for so long because of their 
nocturnal lifestyle and no schooling. As much research as I've done on this, and I'm still aghast at this whole situation. But the community. So the community came together. I mean, just like I am and just like you probably are, were outraged. And in no time, they had new clothing for all of the siblings. And they created a fund and quickly raised $200,000 for their support. A lot of this came from the Corona Chamber of Commerce, which is about 40 minutes outside of Paris. And this Chamber of Commerce eventually raised $400,000 for the family. And they had donations that came from all over the world. They said each adult sibling got a new pair of shoes and they would sleep in them because they were afraid they would be taken away. I mean, that's just incredible. I mean, that's horrible. I mean, these kids, and like I said, we keep referring to them as kids, even though legally they're adults, but but have they ever really grown up? And they getting a new pair of shoes is such a big thing for them that they're terrified of them being taken away. It's just horrible. They also learned that none of the 13 had ever seen a dentist, and someone came forward and offered free dental care for life. When the family of or the estate of John Denver learned that they were fans of John Denver, they sent a box of his complete discography for the kids to listen to. Fender Guitar donated 13 acoustic guitars to the kids because a part of their therapy was music therapy because that's something that, that they did take to pretty well. World-famous cellist Yo-Yo Ma came to the hospital and played a private concert for all 13 of the siblings. And this was the first time that the adults and the juveniles were back together again, although they had been having daily Skype video conferences with each other. But this was the first time they were physically together, and they were very excited. They said the boys outgrew their clothing in only one month. And, of course, there were new clothes ready and waiting for them. And this one touched my heart. A homeless man came up to one of the people that were was collecting money, and he reached into his pocket and pulled out $2.88. And that's probably all that this guy had. But he gave it to them and said he wanted to do something to help the kids. I mean, everybody is just heartbroken over this. Sure. And, I mean, here's a guy, a homeless man who himself has his own problems and and his and his own struggles and is so touched by their story that he gives you know probably all the money that he had to try to help them it's a very touching sentiment and and one of the few bright spots of humanity in this story well while in the hospital the boys they got haircuts all of the kids and adults had their own, basically a play area outside the hospital where they could, you know, be alone with each other and play. They could exercise, play soccer and basketball. They learned that they loved lentil soup, fish and lasagna, but they could no longer tolerate burritos. And as you would imagine, the hospital staff became very emotionally involved with all of these 13, as did the, the police and the investigators involved. And they all said that they didn't sleep well for weeks after first coming into contact with them, which, like I said, any law enforcement officer will tell you the things they remember involve kids and nurses will tell you the same thing. The kids were showing love and attachment to the hospital staff, and they would even make bracelets as their gifts of love for them. After two months in the hospital, the adult siblings were taken to a remote and heavily secretive supervised living facility where they had to learn to become adults. They had to learn basic things such as bathing, cooking, shopping, laundry, and basic finance, and how to care for themselves. Now, they cried when they had to leave the hospital. They said they had got them outside and they're trying to load them up into cars and they would sneak and go back into the hospital because they just didn't want to leave this best environment they had ever been in in their lives. The six younger ones were moved into two foster homes. So finally, we've reached the court portion and I'm ready for this portion because these people need to pay for this. I mean, they really do. There ended up being a total of 75 charges filed against David and Louise, and that punishment ranged from 94 years to life. 12 counts of torture on all of the kids except Jana, 
12 counts of false imprisonment, 7 counts of cruelty to an adult dependent, 6 counts of willful child cruelty, 1 count of lewd act by force or fear on a child against David only. David was also charged with 8 counts of perjury for each year he filed his private school affidavit. These were charges for the offenses in California from June 11, 2010 through January 14, 2018, because they, like we said, they moved around so much that there's jurisdictional issues. So California could only charge them for offenses that occurred in California. They pled not guilty to all charges in their preliminary hearing. In a preliminary hearing, the defendants plead guilty or not guilty, and then the prosecutor lays out his case for a judge so that there can be a determination as to whether or not there's enough evidence to move to trial. And obviously in this, there was, they played Jordan's 911 call. And during this, Luis cried and David took notes. Now with all this evidence stacked up against them, February of 2019, David and Luis plead guilty to 14 charges of torture and abuse. The prosecutors made sure that they pled to at least one charge per child and were sentenced to life with the possibility of parole after 25 years. I know a lot of people and my initial thoughts are, why do we, oh man, why do we make a plea agreement with these people? Let's hammer them. They need the 94 years to life. They need to never get out. But the prosecutors have to weigh the whole situation and not let emotion take over. And by allowing them to take a plea, they were able to keep these siblings off the stand. All right. So they wouldn't have to testify in front of their mother and father and basically re-abuse them, open up these wounds that are just now starting to heal. So I hate it on one hand because I think the parents should have got the full ride. They deserve the full ride. But I see why that decision was made, because it was made for the benefit of the kids in the long term. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the sentence hearing, because this was gave the children a chance to make a statement. Jennifer, the oldest, said her parents had taken her whole life away from her, but now she is taking it back and she was now in college. Joshua said he still had nightmares of what happened to him, but he has now learned to ride a bike, and he was in college. Joshua read a message from one of the other daughters, and it said, I love both of my parents so much. Although it may not have been the best way of raising us, I'm glad they did it because it made me the person I am today. I just want to thank them for teaching me about God and faith. Joy said she felt that mother and father felt that God blessed them with all of their children, so they kept their children away from the world and trusted God would guide them through life. She believes her parents became overwhelmed and were afraid if they asked for help, they would get their kids taken away. She also asked that the judge lift the restraining order so she could talk to her parents, which was also the shared feelings of some of the other siblings. And that's what we talked about. I mean, that's just incredibly sad. We see through the statements of the children that they don't, they even at this point, don't have a, a, a big grasp on what's going on. I mean, and they still, they this is their normal. They love their parents. And you even see some defending of the parents a little bit. It, it just It just goes to show the immense power of that psychological hold that the parents had over the kids. Well, and you see this in a lot of abused children. I mean, once they're taken out of an abusive situation with parents, they still cry for their mom or their dad because, I mean, that is the attachment that they've had since birth. I mean, it's, it's, it's very sad. We do know now that the adult siblings live across Southern California. They are working on or have gotten their GED and some have gone to college not much is known about the younger ones, which I'm glad we don't because, I mean, they need to move past this point in their life. And hopefully some of them can are at the age where they forgot even what happened. But we do know they have all been adopted. Yeah, and I think it's good that they're, there's not a bunch known about them. You wouldn't want them to be in their new homes, in a new school or something like that. And this be known about them, really. Yeah, and I also saw a report where several of them have changed their names, 
And then the attorney that represents all the kids released a statement not too long ago when asked about how these these kids were doing during the pandemic and being locked down. And he said they were doing just fine. I mean, the type of lockdown they had been in all their lives with a pandemic lockdown, that, I mean, that was easy for them. And it really had not affected them like it did everybody else. Well, this was a tough case this week. Uh, very sad, very disheartening, but I mean, a happy ending at the end. It sounds like everybody is progressing now as they should, and hopefully their parents will have a long stay in in their own cage. Yeah, we, we hope so. But again, the reason we cover this is so that we remember what these kids went through and that we as a society, we are looking out for others. And if you see something... Even if you think, mm, oh, there's a kid digging in trash, and I'm not not blaming the neighbor who didn't call, but you see a kid digging in the trash, it never hurts to call the police and let them figure out why. Because at any point, if the police had gone to this home and smelled the stench and seen the living conditions, we just think maybe something could have been done. We don't know. And there were lots of arguments about who to blame. Well, Louise's family saw, David's family saw, the neighbors saw things, nobody reported. It's because they were homeschooled. There is absolutely no one to blame in this except David and Louise. But again, as a society, we have to look out for those who can't look out for themselves. And I beg you, see something, say something. That's right. We've got to look out for each other. We hope you've enjoyed the case this week. And as always, We'll see you next week. We would like to hear your thoughts on this and all of our cases. And as always, you can reach us by email at truecrimeoutloud at gmail.com, Facebook and Instagram at truecrimeoutloud. Outloud is two words, not one, and Twitter at TC Outloud. Photos, links, and sources for this case can be found on our website at www.truecrimeoutloud.com. 